My name is Tessa Kate Lowe, and I'm a member of Writers Without Borders, where normally I share my poetry, but on this occasion I needed to share this story, uh, which hardly has a title, but we'll just go into a preface. There was an old woman who lived in her head. She made it all up. Soon she'll be dead. Once upon a time there was a foolish old woman. Not perhaps so very old, more in the glorious autumn of her days. Perhaps not so very old, but certainly very foolish and vain. Is there anything you can think of that is more foolish than a vain old woman? Probably not. Which is why we could anticipate that she might find herself in all kinds of laughable situations. For what is a fool for, if not to be laughed at? The name of the woman was Kate, and just of late she had found herself wandering vaguely round a country that was too vast for her comprehension. Not all the way round it, just the safe and sultry southern western tip of it, a small circumscribed region of which she foolishly and vainly felt she was mistress, and thereby hangs our tale. It was a world populated mainly by young men of indeterminate age and motivation, and a few, just a very few, women. Most of the women of the land were kept securely in seclusion behind the safe confines of their homes, and certainly sequestered by custom far away from intercourse with young men of indeterminate age and motivation. This left the young men, and the older ones too, mainly in the company of each other, hands held and arms fraternally round shoulder, eternally wandering and wondering about women. Mothers and sisters they knew, idolised and revered. And they were wont to wait until a marriage was arranged before they came to no one in the flesh. What then went on behind closed doors we can never be quite sure. But many children were born. Many girl children disappeared soon after birth, and many wives were murdered or jumped off rocks into the sea. Many also produced future wives and sisters, so the world kept turning regularly on its own axis, with not much changing from millennium to millennium, until the wider part of it discovered the sultry fertile charms and descended on its beaches and its hills in ever-increasing lotus-seeking numbers. Young women, middle-aged women, women in the sunset of their days came, stripped off their winter woolens and warmed themselves, bare-legged, bare-backed, bikinied and bounteous, oblivious to the effect on the hordes of young men, who were like hunters or fishermen, suddenly faced for the first time with herds of wildebeest migrating across a previously barren land, or a shoal of slippery fish which had somehow lost their way from the wide Sargasso Sea. At first they were bewildered, quite without the wiles or wisdom, to know how to begin to entrap and take advantage of such unexpected, unknown bounty. But they got together in a brotherly band, and it was not too long before they had figured a way, or ways, of taking best advantage of the strange fish that had landed on their shores. One such was our foolish, vain old woman. More a lady, to give her some due. What exactly she was doing, wandering about on her own, separated from any herd or shoal, we have no way of really knowing or understanding. For it is probable that she herself had no real idea. But there she was, in a glorious, simple, beguiling and unbeguiled paradise, as far as she could tell, where people called her ma'am or mom, or sometimes even madam, and treated her with friendliness and due deferent respect. They seemed to really like her, not to find her strange at all, but something rare and precious, and so began her fall. One morning, whilst Kate was sitting on her own, relishing an unusual but delicious local breakfast, overlooking tall coconut palms and the verdant rampant water plants 
that all but covered the backwaters with promise of the lotuses to come. She was interrupted in her reverie by the waiter, who wondered whether ma'am might be wanting anything more. She didn't, but the young man asked whether he might sit and talk a while. He was hungry for conversation, as his colleagues only ever talked about sport, whilst he was interested in plants and birds and wildlife. He was, in his mind's eye, reshaping that piece of overgrowth. When the rain stopped, he was going to thin it out, give it form, make space for the sacred flowers to reveal themselves in all their beauty. He had been a gardener. As a boy, he had helped his grandfather on the land, had gone on to tend the gardens of the foreigners who came for two or three months a year to enjoy their second homes. He had not been a waiter for long and was missing his contact with the soil, was pleased to be able to practice his English. Kate was happy to chat. She was always happy to chat. Not many local people spoke English quite as well as he did, and plants and birds and gardens were quite one of her things. She told him how she had been at that very table the year before, but later on in the season, when the jungle growth was not so lush and the lily pads sparkled in the sunshine, offering their lotuses to the sky. She had taken some beautiful photographs. He might be pleased to see them. She thought he would like to see how it could be. So a quiet friendship began. She would sometimes come for breakfast and on occasion supper. Not every day, you understand, but often enough. It could have been because he would quietly say as she was leaving, see you tomorrow. They didn't talk every day or even very much, for usually there were other diners and he was a good and conscientious, shy and gentle young waiter. But somehow, see you tomorrow proved prophetic and she took him one day to see the photographs. She was proud of them and pleased to have someone to share them with who would really appreciate their beauty and who had visions for that pool this year. Sometimes she wondered why a quiet, thoughtful, good-looking young man should be bothered to spend much time talking to a so much older woman, but she was not too much exercised by this question. She wasn't bad company, she supposed. She had plenty to say, and he seemed happy to listen. She was vain enough to dismiss the question on the odd occasion it popped into her wise head. Her foolish heart overruled. It was good to have a friend. Kate, in fact, had many friends. She had been in that part of her wanderings for at least two weeks, and she gathered friends like flowers. Perhaps it was because she was old and foolish. Yet come to think of it, she'd been young and foolish for most of her life in that regard. She never seemed to get any the wiser. Must have been the vanity. She never ever suspected that just because someone was friendly and claimed to be her friend because she was kind and good and sweet and lovely, there could be any ulterior motive. She was clever, but not very intelligent. In many ways a slow learner. Autistic even, for she took everyone and everything literally and blithed about the universe for decades, instantly recovering from hard knocks and shocks. Instantly apart from the years spent in depression, that is. Still, it seemed to work for her. For here she was at 65, no longer suicidal and very much alive, gathering strangers who adopted her as friend, as though she had never had reason to expect anything but loveliness from the human race. Quite out of her depth, but oblivious, she frolicked along, whilst those who knew her shook their heads and crossed their fingers, and hoped, if not for the best, then at least for the betterment. Most had given up trying to bring her to add a little reality to her unshakable faith in the universal goodness of mankind. It seemed unkind and pointless. So the wise one stopped their worrying and left her to her interesting but erratic fate. What to do with Kate? Best just to pray and get on with your day. Sometimes I think she was not so much vain as insecure. Why else would anyone need compulsively to gather friends in increasing hordes and hoard them like a miser with too much gold, loath to let go of a single coin, 
though the market be falling and it would soon be of less worth than a sou. I don't know. Neither did Kate. There was much she didn't know, though she tried to understand. The more she understood, it seems, the less she knew, or the less she grew, for she never seemed to change, and the story could get quite boring, for she was in deep denial, and would digress down any teasing pathway, exhausting herself and others in her restless, pointless, relentless ramblings. She really was too busy to stop and take stock of it all, so I will have to do it for her. Stop this digressing and tell it straight. Once upon a time, there was a foolish old woman who unwittingly allowed herself to be seduced by a sophisticated Lothario posing as a virgin on a beach. She thought, oh, who cares what she thought, on a beach, holding hands, being sixteen and courted. You could have foretold that it would end in disaster. It did. No more interesting then than Red Riding Hood and the Wolf. She lived to love another day, but we have no idea what became of him. For having eaten of the goodies in her basket, he had had his fill and gone away. The end. Here at last the laugh you were promised. Our foolish, vain old lady had in fact thought she was wittingly seducing a willing young virgin of indeterminate age and motivation so as to enable one previously sequestered bride by arrangement to be, to have a kind young husband who knew something about women's emotional and physical needs. Too late she realized he could teach her a thing or two. Altogether, ah, uh ha! -huh. There was an old woman who lived in her head. She made it all up. Soon she'll be dead. <laughs>